Rock and roll. Kia ora, everybody. What's up? It is Rebet. Uh, welcome to Rebet Live. Friday in New Zealand. Big day for New Zealand. About to head into the weekend. Elections popping. Things are happening. And we're very, very lucky indeed today. Have a good friend on the show, Mr. Dion Nash. And without further ado, Mr. Dion Nash. How are you, mate? I'm really good, Rebet. How are you? I'll get the claps out of the way. I'll tone the intro track back down. And we're into it. How are you, brother? I'm really good. I'm really good. It's a uh, uh, little chilly in Auckland this morning, but um, apart from that, we we feel like we're coming out of winter into summer, so things are good. You seem like you've got quite a pep in your step this morning. Has life been good to you recently? Uh, has life been good? Oh, it's been okay. Yeah, I can't complain too much. Um, you know, but uh, on the scale of of uh, world uh, wellness and health, I guess uh, we're doing pretty well down here in New Zealand, and and um, you know, business is good or goodish, you know. All things considered. Family is healthy. We... That, actually, the family health being healthy is probably the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to ask how the, how the boss was, clearly keeping you in check, which is good. Um, <laughs> w- when we first went into lockdown, you were one of the f- – actually – we had a conversation the day before lockdown. You were the, I think you might have been the first one before we went into the, to all of it. And so maybe let's start here. Since that day in March the 5th, no, when was it? March? I think it was March, right? Um, what has been the biggest learning that you found about yourself personally and professionally since we last, or since we spoke the day before lockdown? Oh, just going with the really light-hearted question straight off the bat. No, 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 no. <laughs> we can get into politics and then sport and, and the Raiders soon. Don't worry about that. But what I've been intrigued with is content and time. Like we do it, we do a moment and you did an IP download of where you're at. You know, the first chime was mm. the, the fear of what was going to happen next, um, what it was going to mean for the country, community, culture, everything. And then, you know, coming back into it, we obviously had the old rope stuff, which was the state of, I guess, mental health of what was happening within it too. And then now we've come out of lockdown, I guess, number round two. Now we're back into the mix and the engines are firing again. That's where the context of a timestamp of where the headspace is at, because I guess we've had, we've, we've been through a, well, a bit I, in the I, last little while. So I was keen to, what yeah, do you think? I, I think that, well, the, the themes, I guess, that are running through my head at, mm. at the present time are, are around resilience and robustness. Um, I think there's still a huge amount of uncertainty uh, from a from a business perspective, particularly, but also, um, you know, clearly from the world and health uh, and what's going on. So, um, I think robustness, the sense of resilience, the sense of without a clear pathway forward, staying in the moment and um, and staying upbeat uh, and um, finding ways to to maintain that mental space. Hmm. How's, how's your headspace been man- navigating lockdown, fam, groms, school, business, international logistics, <laughs> commerce? So, so the first, I think when we first spoke about it, it was about, um, you know, it was really crisis mode. No one knew what to yep. expect. Big lockdown, my business, how am I, you know, I going to lose my business? Am I going to have to fire my staff and, you know, all of those things. Um, so the first, I guess, part of that first lockdown was about crisis management and crisis mode. Um, I think the second, lo- and then, and then actually the actual process of the lockdown, uh, there were parts of that were genuine, genuinely enjoyable. You know, p- spending time with your kids on a much more daily basis. Um, you know, uh, just stripping life back a little bit. Um, but I found that process and those things really on some level quite enjoyable but there was always this sort of black cloud uh which um you knew you were going to have to come back and face um, reality at some point um i think then once we got going again there's been um you know, in new zealand i think there's you know people have turned inward um the economy's actually been relatively okay all those um uh you know dollars that would have gone into traveling overseas or you know tourism away from new zealand have turned back inward and i think people have um you know, for certain industries, not all, there's been, um, you know, relatively good times. Um, <clears throat> so there's been a bit of boxing clever to, to try and you know, make sure you're in those categories uh, or work or finding that those sphere dollars. Um, I think the second lockdown 
was a bit of a, a gut punch. I think that yeah, that really the the, the really energy good. got like sapped out of like you could feel it with the like all my conversations, everything, and it's quite funny because I've been, I guess, I'm still here in the states, but all the tone it almost felt like they'd maybe drunk too much of the Kool-Aid too soon in this fairyland of, you know, Disneyland shit. And then it kind of, it felt like the dip was way worse than people maybe have had expected, expected emotionally or mentally. Right. Like, I think you're totally right on that. Yeah. And I think, um, if I sort of go back to what I'm talking about around, around resilience, I think one of the things it, it feels like lockdowns without a sense of, of, uh, uh, without, you, without a, a sort of sense of you know here's the strategy going forward just to but that is quite a hard thing to sort of keep getting your head around and keep, because there's so much uncertainty that comes with it um and i think that that sort of seemed to slow everybody up and for us um you know it was coming into summer as well it just sort of seemed to really halt momentum mm. so that 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 took a, probably a lot of the wind out of the sails and i think really what we've been doing now is just trying to get you know that word momentum back up uh, and get back going again because christmas is coming and that's you know for, for my industry a hugely important time um, mm. and, and i think for most industries um but so <clears throat> trying to get back on on get get staff back engaged fully get um you know confidence back really get um all of your systems back going you know we've lost a lot of time in terms of shipping and manufacturing and and um you know all of those things so you're behind on a lot of stuff so there's a little bit of um you know all of that managing problems that's been going on um but uh, but it, i think uh that's you know the, the flip side of that is we've, we've been expecting that you know you almost mm. you can't go through the sort of a pandemic or a crisis like this without these types of setbacks so i think that mm. um most business people I'm talking are relatively resilient to the to what's going on at this point. So, uh, on the uh, you know you t- you've brought up resilience a couple of times. Most people in every sports person that goes to an elite level has to constantly deal with like mental resilience on a daily basis with probably a lot more pressure pressures than the average old mate john that lives down the street right for you going through this you would have i guess gone into kickoff mode because you've already used parts of of your inner strength before parts of that headspace before it's not new for you except you're probably just not in a you're in a different uniform doing a doing a doing a thing i do feel that a lot of the masses haven't had that sort of maybe mental pressure like this before to a similar similar thing so that dip was actually more that not that they didn't know if they could handle it because i think a lot of people obviously could but that they hadn't actually been to those darker places before or that the the really really gnarly um at scale across the entire nation every single person for that resiliency so i think you're definitely right on that because it was almost forced resiliency um with no other option it's not like you know you choose to be a professional athlete you choose to go on the field you choose to dot 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 this almost felt like you didn't have a choice and it was happening to you whether you liked it or not right so i think it's really um uh, interesting that the next so you go oh yeah no just a final point on that yeah i totally yeah. agree i think and i think i mean i always remember gilbert anoka who you know he was our mm. So, so, psych guy, uh, and he works with the All Blacks and people like that now. But he was, um, he always sort of his one of the big things he always did is you know, focus on the controllables, uh, mm. and the things that were, uh, and and that was a huge sort of thing to keep coming back to. It. You know, what uh, really stressful situations are when there's so many things outside of your control. Um, but all you can do in those situations is, is come back in and think, what are the things I can affect? You know, what what things can I have some influence over and work on those things? And I think, um, you know, that having been learnt those lessons, I guess, through sport definitely helped. But I, as you say, I think, you know, generally people are resilient and it's not until you get tested in times like this that it that it's, comes out of you. you know? So... Uh, Rebuilding back up, um, you talked about the word momentum and, you know, the snowball effect of, I guess, trying to cascade that down. How, how as a leader in your business, have you tried to snowball momentum back from starting from zero back into it? Like what, what's your sort of been approach from a business perspective with the team and the culture to sort of build that back up, to get the, the energy back high and get everyone back firing? Yeah, well, our financial year runs from April to March. So we've um, able to have, we just had our six month, um, half year sort of um, meeting with the whole group. So you know, the guys in the UK um, called in and, um, and and most of the team are here based in Auckland. So we all sort of get together in one big 
session um <clears throat> and that that was really useful and and um you know actually what what we did on this one is you know we obviously everyone reports progress and uh, gets targets and so on and um you know good the good the bad and the ugly gets gets aired but um what i found was um i just recently done something with new zealand trade and enterprise um with guy mark kennedy actually and it was um it was a, around um you know, positioning for growth or um was is the is the sort of the, the thing but basically mark is um you know really experienced marketing guy with huge worked on massive brands and he and it was for me personally it was a really great experience to go back into something that i you know with my background and where i sort of come from and just to triggered off in a one hour session or two hour session you know all of these just remembering all of these things when i set up my business and my brand is like oh that's right oh you know and mm. going through that process and um and it was a really timely thing to have done right before having that group meeting because i i then went what i did is i actually went back to my first brief that i put to my designer when i started the brand and i looked at that and then i looked at our first iterations of the brand development and our first campaigns and i was like you know how relevant how much on point was it now to then and how how much have we stayed the course mm. um and actually really one a wonderful sort of learning from it was like it's still relevant it still felt really fresh it still felt really good and it still felt like the same brand um and so i was able to take the team through that and say hey listen you know through all that we've been through look look where we started you know and look what we're doing today and it still feels really fresh and relevant but there's also some really great lessons in there you know um about being iconic and about um moving back to sort of um brand focused rather than product focused you know uh and, and in time well, like that's a legacy sort of, right yeah that's right yeah and and you know people fall in love with the brand they don't necessarily fall in love with the product you know sometimes they do but mm -hmm. i think um for for us it's been about brand building building that brand up and representing something in our consumers eyes so i i've just enjoyed um that and that's probably what stimulated me personally um for the last and, mm. and 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 help me get my motivation back and i think once you as a leader are motivated this sort of naturally sort of flows down um and all of a sudden um you know people that you're working with can bounce off that energy so but yeah i That's think cool. that was a really timely thing it's as a leader's perspective interesting yeah you get so focused on product of it then then necessarily brand and icon icon legacy like jay-z's got this line would you would you rather be a trend or ralph lauren you know <laughs> like trend yeah. is for the moment <laughs> legacy forever playing forever yeah. you know and it, it wasn't in a rat like he just talked about it and then i had another f uh, friend who got to go for to dinner with the head of louis vuitton hvml group or whatever it was um in singapore um and then he, he basically said my i don't give a shit about anything at all except the legacy of this brand that is the only yeah. thing i control nothing else matters don't even care about it. and it was so vehement on this one thing because he said if we if we lose that the product doesn't matter the people don't even matter because there's going to be no people distribution won't matter logistics won't matter nothing matters and it was quite um i guess valid must be probably validating as a leader to know hey we you know keep keep eye on the prize for the big things of what we're actually trying to build here around brand not necessarily products which come and go Mm. well yeah and That's and cool. yeah, there's so many so many components to it too you know like letting the people do their job on the bus you know we talked about an old boss of mine um jeff ross talked talked he had the favorite ricky stewart story ricky stewart was the halfback <laughs> for the raiders back in the day um the the, the canberra raiders not oh, your raiders. i know i know <laughs> um so he uh and he always told the story about ricky stewart he, when the wallabies one day they beat the all blacks and ricky should have been brought into the motivational speech the night before and ricky Stewart's lesson was um take part just a, if you trust if you go out and you just try to beat your opposition player and you trust the guy on the left of you to beat his man and you trust the guy mm. on the right to beat beat his man or his, her man and um everyone just does their job that's all you do and you tr and you have faith that the other person either side you, you don't try to do someone else's job don't try to cover for someone you just focus on beating the guy in front of you um at the end of 80 minutes you'll have won the game and it's and it's just a sort of like powerful anecdote really around you know it's, it's so often in in life we start to look across the fence at what someone else is doing in their role or we have an opinion on you know what's going on here in the business but we forget that you know we've got a particular role and we need to focus on doing that and if we do that 
and trust everyone else to do theirs, we'll, we'll be much better off. So you know yeah, those man. types of yeah, those types of little things are all they all come they all come full circle. You know, there's times for everything, but we like I've been so lucky. Our, our team we've, we've kept everyone our, 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 through this period, and our team's really stood up. You know, at different times, you know, different people have really come through and shone. Um, and, and even from you know the late the, the last person employed with the with you know the the, the sort of the um, you know the the newest role, if you like, or, um, th you know, th through to the person who's been here the longest, they've all had their moments where they've stood up and done the job. Mm, that's cool, man. Good on you, like not 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 losing a single person, um, cranking it through and getting back in it. Very resilient, Mister Dion, as 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 bloody expected, mate, as expected. <laughs> um, so, I want to talk to politics. Oh, you, good. you mentioned you you mentioned twice in your last uh, little thing about you know the game plan to sort of get out of it. It feels like is there a do you feel a tension from business owners that they don't see a, a clear pl plan or or why that why that remark in terms of the the, the leading out of it is it a um, do you feel there's not yeah, a, a clear path necessarily or what's your vibe? Well, look, I mean, I think I think that polit I think the problem with the pandemic right now is it has become politicized so yes. so much so that that you can't actually have a reasonable conversation around these things. And I was so pleased to see, um, you know, the, the unheard um, guys doing the in, interviewing, um, you know, the, the three scientists from, from who are, who are, you know, every, the way to, the way to sideline someone now is, is, is to uh, call their opinion a reckon or, and that, and that you're not a specialist. So it was so, so it's so great to see some specialists come out and say, Hey, we're just there's other there is another way that we need to be talk, at least talking about and i think that that larger picture i mean clearly there's this huge pandemic and you know there'll be a whole lot of people out there going oh ex cricketer businessman what you what shut up what do you, you know? know and that and that's the problem it's like there's we've we've got to stop doing that and we've all got to step back i think and just say but this is this isn't this thing's here um and how are we going to pick our way through it Mm -hmm. And everyone's important, you know, from the business owners to the epidemiologists to, to the to the man on the street. The, the, everybody's important. And we're all going to have to find a way through it. And I just think that there's been so much focus at the moment on solving the initial impact of it mm -hmm. that there's got to be a time where we sort of step back and go, okay, what's the medium, long term view of how we're going to do it? And um, and and within that, there's a that you know there is a there's a mental health component there's you know just general health and other things and then and then there's the economy and all of those things need to be unpoliticized you know and we need to have a conversation that doesn't involve whether you support the left or the right and doesn't um you know ostracize your point of view based upon that um, and, and that's a really difficult place to be because you know and, and it's a, a bigger topic, but it just seems today's world is so polarized. You know, it's so black and mm. white. It's so you, if the moment you try to uh, nuance any conversation, you get pigeonholed into a, a corner that that just defeats your argument. So um, it's it's a it's, tough one. I don't know how to get through it. No, uh, there's something interesting there around the the fact that it has been politicized 100. Obviously, here in the states, it has even more so. You know, but back in the back in the days of of roaming the mean streets of of I don't know Christchurch, um, ha hats and bandanas were a thing. If you wore, you could wear blue on our side of town. You couldn't wear red. You were because we were um, we were obviously blue and I don't know if the east side. And it, it stood for something. It meant something. There was so much depth to what hat you would wear or what bandana would wear. And you could get into fights if you're in the city, like if you're in, you know, crush those days, whatever. Um, and then if you look at mainstream now in the States, if you're wearing a hat that has MAGA on it, that represents something so gnarly. And people are getting beaten up, almost killed for wearing a hat. Mainstream yeah. people for wearing masks, like bandanas have been politicized like now, like masks or with their right, left. Of, so going out in public with or without something is all of a sudden become, what, do you support Trump or not? Or as a scientist or not, whatever it is. So I think you're right. It's um, unfortunately feels like it's divided more so. But do you feel for New Zealand, yes, it was the team of 5 million for the first round. 
Second round felt like there's a bit of tension sort of building back, but they're now looking at it with the rest of the world. Do you feel that New Zealand is getting that unity again, seeing the, the lockdowns that are going back place in Europe, seeing the 7 million in America? Like, how do you feel that the, the alignment of a nation currently is in New Zealand six months later? I, I think New Zealand's still very much together. I think we're, um, I, but, I, but, you know, I think that, um, I, again, I would remove the politics from that. I don't think it would matter who was leading the country. I think New Zealand is a, is a very tight knit community, and I think that um, that 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 that's one of the things that makes us special. And I think the fact that we are a relatively small nation down at this side of the world, it, it's e it's easy to pull together, it, it, easier to pull together. And I think that we we aren't divided. I think we're all still behind. Um, protecting you know our borders and trying to do the safest thing but i think that but and, and i think that will maintain i don't think there's any mm. real splintering Agreed. or division but i do think that there's a mood for trying to discuss this in a, in a more open fashion and in a, in, a, in a way i think there's a tiredness of being talked uh, at a little bit and, yes. and sort of not getting all of the information and in, at once and i think i think we I think there's a an opportunity for us to be genuinely world leaders uh, right now. You know, we've we've done a great job. We are in a good position. Um, but now what? What's dot, the dot, next, dot. Well, now now what? And so that would be the real opportunity. I think that set, sets in front of us is how collectively, with as a nation, do we now get back on the front foot and show how to deal with this on an ongoing basis? And I and I think. In order to do that, we have to have more, we have to have broader conversations than we're currently having, and, and be willing to to have those conversations. How do we do? How do we do that? Like, if, are we talking about, you know, uh, stuff or the Herald or Media Works or TVNZ opening up for more voices? Is it more openness and willingness for community to genuinely listen, have a have a have debate without you know discourse and and fights? Like, wh how how does that, you know? Yeah, it looks like really in the real world. It's really difficult, right? Um, because of largely because of social media, you know, um, you, you, because it's because it's just not set up for a, for a really nuanced debate on any level. No platformers, um, and and so, or you know, with the exception of maybe YouTube or something like that, and or or, or a podcast forum um, where you can have the longer term, um, more nuanced sort of conversation around things, but. Uh, look, it's really difficult, and I think that's why it really does require genuine thought leadership at this time. It, it's difficult right now because we're in an election cycle. Um, no one's really thinking about anything other than getting re-elected, so our leaders are yeah. just um, in that process. Um, and, of course, you know, all the promises that are being thrown out by everybody um, are really there, not not dealing with this big issue right in front of us. You know, it's just mm. no no one would be brave enough to come out and say, "Hey, I think we need to have a different conversation than locking down the borders at this point," um, for fear of losing the you know the the election. The mess. Um, so, but but the reality of it is, is that that you know, if, if we don't do that, you know, what are we going to do in 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 a, in, in, in a year's time? Are we just going to lock up and? Locked the borders. My business is, was uh, an eighty percent export business. Um, you know, you can't run a, a business like that sort of sat in New Zealand. It's just you know, without it dwindling. You know, um, and so oh, there'll be many businesses like that. And and, um, and 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 we've got to get back and reengage with the world. You know, we're we're a country of four and a half million people. We need those big markets, and we need to be operating in them. Um, but that's it's, it's incredibly hard you know you, who would want to be right now flying into the middle of the states or different parts of the states and and yeah and, um from new zealand you you, you know that that's a, a as we stand right now a relatively um unlikely thing to do and 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 nothing our new zealand government can do can, can change that um at this point mm. but, but but we we must be able to sort of prep prep for it some somehow because it's got to we've got to get back to back to business at some point I get it. The um, you talking about the thought leadership thing. I'm wondering if it goes from thought leadership to thought listening. Do we need more thought listening with by others, not just you know one to say the voice, but then many to actually listen to the others, which gives more views. Because I think you're right on the social side; it becomes very kind of 
um, polarizing and you can't really well, have a, I don't think you win well, debates in a comment section. <laughs> no, you don't, eh? Hey? And you know, people, are, people are genuine. I, I have this sort of, um, once you sit in a room with someone, you know, someone who's polar opposite to you and all of, all points of view, if you sit down in the room with, with them one on one, it's it's very unlikely you walk out of that that room with fisticuffs. You will have come closer yeah. to each other on some level at the end of it. And it's mm. like and, and 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 it's just sitting down. But it's so easy not to get into a room with people at the moment, right? It's easy just to sit off on the side and, and fire your opinion and not listen. But I don't know, man. These are big. These are big challenges. I you know I, if you watch the social network, what's what's the um uh, social dilemma? At the moment? Yeah, social dilemma and and all of the the many many commentators out there you know um saying the same thing it's like we're 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 in uncharted territory through the tools mm. that we've created and um in the social sort of position we find ourselves in mm. so who'd you vote for <laughs> <laughs> <I haven't voted. laughs> um, yeah it's a, I, I think the more you are right. There needs to be more talk about it um, openly because it just kind of feels it's a bit too um, siloed. And, you know, the last thing you want is such a small nation to be so divided when there's so little, um, especially when it comes to not even feeling like there's a platform to, to openly be able to do it. Um, before we go, I want to talk some sport. I would like to talk about two things. One, LeBron versus MJ, goat or not. And then uh, two, the Raiders being the Chiefs. Happy with that. But we can start with LeBron first. Um, you watch the finals, game six? Oh, my son is all over it. And, uh, and Mate, like, he's, what was he reckoning? He's, he's, oh, he, no, he's just all over LeBron James. He just loves it. You know, he's, um, yeah, he, I, I keep having him on. He's only 14, but I, I, you know, I keep having him on about his disloyalty of which team he's actually supporting. He's moved from Miami to, <laughs> to the to LA, and, I'm like, and I'm like, and I'm just like, what, is, what are you doing, mate? <laughs> it's like, what, what do you mean? You switched back. from the Jets. You switched to the Jets yeah, to the Broncos. Yeah, gets, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 gets no, it from no, his old man. Like, that's uh, why. Seahawks, the Seahawks, mate. I've moved again. Seahawks. But, um, yeah, but no, it's, oh, uh, he's in an impossible situation. First of all, what, how good was the Jordan documentary? I, I just loved it for my generation yep. of sports people. Um, and it shows uh, what I, the commentary around that documentary showed just how far society's changed. The fact that I heard so, it's quite a lot of negative commentary around around his behavior and, and the way he built and all the stuff and bullying. And I was just like, my God, uh, all I watched when I he saw was it tame. How, ama how amazing he would be to play with. You know, that's the guy you want to play with. The guy's dem so demanding and just, you know, I couldn't. So it was really confusing for me to watch m more modern, younger players going, commentating and saying what a bully and all of that, and quite, quite a negative. I found it quite confronting because I was like, man, the, uh, I, want, I would want to be in Jordan's team every day, any time, give him to me. Um, <clears throat> and so... That, that was an interesting sort of byproduct of the documentary, but I just loved it for what it was. And obviously, you know, people are saying, oh, it was all propaganda for, for Jordan, but, you know, it's, uh, you, you did get an incredibly raw, open shot of what what, what went on and, and what it was about. Um, but, uh, you, but flip side that to your question about LeBron, I mean, man, he's in an impossible situation, right? And and it's like it's like Ali, like you know, you could make you could make comparisons with Tyson and um, yeah. you know Roy Jones Jr. and all these different great boxes of, but but none of them have the magic of Ali. And what and what made that? Well, he he stood up against Vietnam. He fought at a time when TV was coming online and and mainstream. He was a global sensation, and he had a wit unmatched out in any sport. Uh, and by the way, he had five of the best heavyweight boxers of all time in his era that he fought against. So he had these titanic matches, fights, and so that set of circumstances is once in a hundred years, maybe more. You know, uh, and Jordan, if you look at him compared to James, Jordan sort of had the same thing. You know, he came in, he was he was a one man show. He changed the whole thing. He took an unknown franchise. He raised the game beyond its own borders. 
he he won six in a row uh, and at a time you know he, he was he represented and, and then Nike he came at the same time so many the things timing. happen yep. of timing and all of it you can't replicate so <clears throat> so when you sort of talk about the goat it's, it's sort of a non-argument for me it's just like that those there's certain guys who you just have that magic of of a moment and did something and Jordan's one of those I'm not I, I don't think LeBron has had the opportunity to be one of those so I think as a player just as a pure player um you know those are diff- that's a different argument I think you can start to you know peel that back and then it's still academic right mm. No, it's interesting obviously you know now he's one number four with team number three MVP it feels looking at it that he actually potentially did more um, with actually less, you know, um, some of those teams and what he had to sort of go through opposed to, you know, he had um, Jackson and obviously Pippen there's right hand consistently through it. Yeah. I do like the idea though, that it's now starting to become a bit more of a potential even debate than so lopsided because LeBron hadn't got up there. So it at least feels like it's kind of on a, a even field. Um, and then finally, before we go, Mr. Dion Nash, um, NFL, how, yes. you, how are you feeling? What's your, uh, man, I, man, What's I your- just, I, I, I thought of you, I watched the Raiders game and I just, I was watching you and I, I, I I couldn't believe it was happening. I couldn't believe it until right to the end. I had to. <laughs> it was. You needed insane. that. You needed that. You needed that full. I mean, to beat to beat the Chiefs the way the Chiefs have been playing was just huge, right? Just huge. It was like and, um, and a legit team. It was. It was everyone. But, like Mahomes was in. Everyone was in. Kelsey was in. But you know what? But you know what? I reckon the commentators haven't made enough of is the week before against the Chiefs. Um, a Patriots team without Cam Newton, a really depleted sort of a, attacking team without the kingpin, actually pushed the Chiefs and and made Mahomes make some really bad throws and look look off off his game for a good forty, um, you know, good sort of sixty percent of that match. It was only right at the end that a couple of intercepts and and the things went back the way, but. If you actually draw back to it, that they had already just shown, I think, a little bit of how to defend against Mahomes mm-hmm. and how to put him off. Um, and it wasn't about the pass rush, you know, it was like about just hanging back and let making him make a decision over time. Yeah. Um, but um and 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 you know, the watching the Raiders, they just they just took that and went one little further and then they yeah, you know, they played right. But it was it was really cool to watch, I I, I must admit. But it's a weird season, right? It's um it's so Vegas many people maybe. out with COVID and, and uh, I know yeah. and we've been postponed and all sorts of shit. You see Nick Saban from Alabama just got it. Oh man, I, I I'm um you know, I, I I've been watching I'm a sea just so for the record, I'm now a Seahawks fan. So and, oh. and have been and have been sort of from day one. That's been my second Oh my record. gosh. You just gave your son shit for switching three teams <laughs> and you've done the flipping same thing. You've gone east coast to west coast. Yeah, but um, oh my gosh! But man, watching Russell, Russell watching Russell Wilson is a, is just a joy at the moment. Hey, what a fantastic! The fourth quarter comeback was pretty legit. I, I'll tell you that yeah. much. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been it's, it's great. I I I think the thing I love about it is um, for me having played sport in New Zealand, sort of sports, rugby, cricket, you know, all those types of things. It's really enjoyable to be a complete another novice fan. Uh, with NFL, you know, like, you know, I can be a, 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 a dork about it and, and sort of a, a, and listen to it with um with open ears. So be, the, like be the rookie. Yeah, I'm enjoying that process. Yeah, it's great. Oh, that's awesome, brother. Um, well, appreciate your time, my friend. Um, always good catching up and connecting. Uh, when I'm back, we shall go to the driving range and hit the shit out of some balls. It will be awesome. Yeah. No, I look forward to it, man. You're looking really well. So um, keep up the good work. Mate, I've had a full summer of doing nothing. What do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> got the pool, yeah. got the hang. No, it's, blue, be, it's blue skies. Be, it's blue skies. I'm looking forward to a bit of sun. I'm a bit getting rid of my coat and get into it. I get you, brother. Hey, right, man. Love your work, dude. I'll talk to you soon, Dion. See you, bro. All right, bro. Yeah. Later. Peace. Dion Nash, ladies and gentlemen. Great human. Good friend. Known him for yonks. Um, and he's been bald ever since I know him. He's a great mate. Ladies and gentlemen. Claps coming up. We're about to get into it. Holly Bennett. Hello, Holly. 
Are you there? Yes, kia ora. How are you? So there was a bit of a lag. I don't know if it was me or you. Yeah, I don't know. I just moved my um, my camera onto data, so I'm hoping Ooh. that it's not me and that it's you, but we'll see how it goes. Hey, okay. How are you, Miss Holly Bennett? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Um, I'm very excited to talk. Uh, final, last day's election. What is happening? How are you feeling? <laughs> is it I'm like so a- happy. I'm so happy that tomorrow is election day. Like, I'm just so over all of this. <laughs> I do it for my job and I'm just exhausted. So God forbid how all the politicians are feeling. I mean, yeah, as we know, 2020 has been an absolute dumpster fire with COVID and just an election on top of it. And everyone, yeah, I can just feel the fatigue. So yep. I'm really, and v- really Visually, excited everyone looks tomorrow. tapped as well. Visually, Absolutely. everyone just looks tapped. Absolutely. Well, I mean, like, I'm not going to lie. Both the female leaders looked great last night on television. Oh. I was like, damn. Like, coming through like that. And it's like two days before the election. They both just looked on the game. But, you know. Who won it? I don't know. It wasn't even a – it didn't feel the same as other debates. It felt more different, more jovial, more, um, yeah, just more friendly what i would say is that i think that the as she always does um jacinda nailed talking down the barrel you know talking direct to the camera getting the message out there you know just vote for me or i quit oh well hey that was interesting wasn't it i didn't let's talk about that for a second yeah absolutely so for those who didn't see it basically she said if she loses this election she'll walk away from politics and onto other things so if you want her to stay and vote for labor full stop quite the quite the aggressive move quite the the statement yeah i wasn't expecting that at all i didn't even i mean yeah i just didn't sort of come into my brain but then i guess what she's saying is that if people don't want a labor led government they'd make that decision so she'd move on and you know time for some fresh leadership well she's already had the wins from a global perspective she's already mm. got all the upside if it did flip on her she's probably got nothing but um it's probably the, it would be the smart move to then to then bail out as well right so i think it was interesting kind of though like question. I, I want to see, you know, I, I have. I don't know if you've seen any speculation following the announcement. I haven't looked at it in any of it yet. But it's always the same people that talk about, you know, where she might be gearing up to go for. And rather than you listening in. to exactly what she said, which is that like, I don't have any other plans, but if I were to not be elected prime minister, I am I don't know what I'm going to be doing, Like, I, but I will leave politics. Why can't people take these comments at face value? It always because has to be, you know. No, it's because they're must- politicians. There always is something. Why can't they just believe politicians? Like, because they're politicians. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying is that I don't think there's any malicious intent no, no. behind that statement. Whereas you watch, mm. then all the people come out and say, oh, but there's this and must be that. And da, da, da. I think that's so far fetched. It's like a conspiracy mm. theory. So at the way it's looking, Labor could um, could take uh, the lead with Greens partnered up, but they were just saying from the la- la- last poll. How, is that good or bad thoughts? Um, I think that for the rhetoric, the commentary that I've seen, um, everyone's believing it's a foregone conclusion. And I just look at it from the like what, what history tells us. And in 2017, under Bill, Um, National had the exact same polling numbers, 46%. They only pulled in, I think it was 42 on the night um, and couldn't get across the line. And so, you know, there's a lot of what ifs. Um, Yes, they're in a super strong position and um, Greens are on 8%. They would need Greens to be able to form a government, whether that looks like a coalition or a confidence and supply. Uh, That's up to the leaders to uh, negotiate, but I wouldn't be calling it yet at all. Um, just given what happened in 2017 and as I've said to you before multi party dropping out I didn't anticipate that which kind of changed the entire landscape and um, yeah you just we just never know what's going to happen on the night mm. how's your boy um, the boy Seymour with the social game he been on fire again is he, is he, how's he climbing up the numbers well 
he, he's still on 8%, but I was just going to say, believe it or not, I do not spend my life following David Seymour around on social media. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't give you too much of a <laughs> um, an update other than um, there was a post that he put up the other day, which I kicked off on um, some of the people in the comments. I thought that they were conflating two issues and I thought they just needed to be checked on some of their assumptions. But then it Fair didn't enough. turn out to be anything useful. So I thought, why am I doing this? It's not helping my business. It's not helping my clients. You, you can't, yeah, you can't, you can't want to debate through a comment section with strangers you haven't met if you can't see them in person, that's for sure. You could be battling against a, a 12 year old oh, yeah, after stolen their parents' yeah, RTDs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what Absolutely. is the thing that exactly. you're, you're most, um, uh, what matters to you most this week? What's bubbling away that you, you want to um, talk about or get across? Um, a young lobbyist calling out the industry. Let's talk about that. On Tuesday, something happened. Go there. So on Tuesday, there was an article that was put out about me and my entre- entrepreneurial journey through um, National Business Review. And I was great, very grateful for the opportunity to talk about myself because it's one of my favorite topics, jokes. <laughs> and, and so I got to talk about business and sort of what I wanted to achieve through my industry. Um, my industry is notoriously um, very, very hard to break into, very shut down. There's not a lot of pathways and there's not a lot of um, knowledge around the industry. And then so on the back of that, put out a press release yesterday just calling for um, – perhaps the incoming government to take a look at the sector, not because I think that um, we need to suddenly uh, regulate or maybe put um, up parameters to change the shape and nature of the industry itself, but to provide more transparency and more clarity to New Zealanders as what our industry does. Because every time this conversation comes up about lobbying in Aotearoa, the overwhelming commentary from the sector is there's nothing to see here it's not dark arts just believe us and I really don't think that's good enough for my sector I've got nothing to hide so I would say absolutely if you want to come and take a look at us if you want to have a conversation I'm here for it uh, because I think the more people that know about these skills therefore the more competition that we can increase in the sector the better it will be whether or not it happens to be seen but at least I just want to start the conversation that you know the industry's here and it should have a little look at it should there should be a little look at it well either it's because two things one you're clean and no one's got dirt on you or two you know a bunch of others aren't clean and you've got stuff on them <laughs> um i think it's i think it's wider than that i think it's no i about, agree you know you think about how many times you know sorry no like how many times i'll introduce myself as a lobbyist and people go what's that and then i have to explain you know and I've got it down so succinctly now which I can say it in about like 20 words and then get it over and done with but that again it's like if so if you if somebody asks me or oh, what do you do and I say a lawyer they'll know what it is that I'm talking about or if accountant or broadcaster or whatever it is you know but time and time again I get the oh what's that and then what does that entail and then I'll get oh I didn't even know that was a thing that's a problem That's a problem Mm. the sector needs to help resolve because we know how to resolve it, but we need to be willing to talk about it. It's an awareness and education issue, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, again, if you've got nothing to hide, then, you know, should be, I, I, my view is that we should be open to it. Um, And how would that change? Like how, what would that look like? Is it a big PR campaign blitz of like lobbyists do dot, dot, dot? What, what, what would that look like? I think that for me, the reason why I put the um, widow or the challenge out to government to take a look at the industry is to really help the government put structure around the direction of the conversation rather than have the sector n- like navigate that themselves because mm. obviously people are inherently self-interested. Um, so if we do it ourselves, it could get, you know, it could get messy. Rather, if you have government having a little look at this industry, then it's all the players within the industry coming to the government to, you know, basically um, say say their piece and then the government then having, you know, being able to, I guess, report back. Um, mm. 
it is again something that a select committee could do if they did want to have a look at it um it's just something that i think the conversation it's time to have it it's well overdue um and it's it hasn't happened and i think that the industry should be saying yeah let's talk about talk about it a little bit more well, good on you because you're on the inside saying it needs to be a thing. Um, most of the time, would be on the outside if something's going wrong internally. Then they would be trying to put a um, shine a spotlight on it. But if you're from the inside, you're you're like a whistleblower. But there's nothing to um, to whistle yet, just yet. But yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing is that the conversation around lobbyists is always the idea that you know it's dark arts, that it's elitist. briefcases. Cash. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Penthouse. And I want to say, like, any of these critics are more than welcome to follow me around in my day to day, and they'll see that it's not like that at all. Um, and I just use the power of information that's before me, and then obviously a, a tried and true way of, um, you know, navigating my what I do, which is parliament and politics to then um, get outcomes for clients. So it's advocacy mm. at its finest. There's nothing dodgy, but, you know, people will say, oh, it kind of sounds weird. I don't understand how it works. So therefore we should regulate. So they go from like zero to 100 in, you know, six seconds. And I'm like, why don't we just first just look at the industry itself, even just define it. I don't know if you could even t say how many lobbyists there are in this country because we don't even know. And therefore, then we are unable to say, is it a career path? I argue that it is. I think we could get more people into this industry and actually have more people providing more services better, um, more competitively. But we actually need to find out what the scope of the industry is first, then look at it from there. I get it. Um, and plus, we all know you, got, you don't even accept cash anymore it's not bags of cash it's just diamonds right it's just what that's how you guys accept your your little oh, your, your payoffs. Just, yeah you know like all of these earrings come on they don't <laughs> um holly i'm i'm going to be very excited for next week's show when you find out the the, the winners and losers and how this shapes up and then we don't need yeah. to talk about the election anymore and we could talk about other other great things in, in life and the rest of it. well then we go into 100 days of the government right and mm. then we can see what's going to happen and have conversations about what, you know, things that you see and like deconstruct stuff. And then also talk about the age old thing is that what is happening re COVID and our pathway forward, because Dion touched on it. And I think it's absolutely correct to say, you know, this is something we're going to have to live with. So then what's the conversation going to look like? And I get it right now. It's on, it's on pause because we've got an election. Um, mm. But we need to pick it up quite quickly and, um, yeah, say, like, look at how all businesses are going to operate uh, going forward and if it's going to have to cha make change radically. And, it, and they'll be forced upon it because everyone's going to then go, okay, cool, you're in, now what? Show us the goodies. Yeah, um, absolutely. Holly Bennett, absolutely. Appreciate the time. Enjoy the rest of the day. Have fun with whatever you're doing, wherever you're going. Enjoy the weekend and I'll talk to you very, very shortly. Thank you, bro. Kakite. Love your work. See you soon. Bye. Holly Bennett, ladies and gentlemen. She's over talking about politics for the week. It's been nothing but politics, politics for months for her coming into this whole thing, but it is important. Uh, if you got to vote, you got to get in the mix, got to do some cool stuff. Uh, last but not least, very excited. We're talking content. We're talking connection. We're talking cool things media. It is Cassie Roma. How are you, Cassie? How Clacks. are you? A okay. Uh, have you have you voted yet? You're all excited. You're ready to rumble. Are you are you are you energized for the weekend? Have you gone for your run? What are you doing? Dude. Where are you at? I can see you've got some light going on. Heaps on. Got some light. Whoa! I took a, I took um a little card out of your game, man. And I'm like, okay, no hat for Rebet, no hat for me. There you go. Um, my my, my mop's a bit Friday, different. Friday. <laughs> That's Friday, right. Friday. Friday. Uh, to answer your questions, yes, I have voted in both elections, um, done my civic duty, as it were. Um, so that's really cool. That's that's nice. the second time I've been able to vote twice. Um, this last week, what has been the thing that's been most pressing in your in your in your mind that you would like to discuss, Ms. Ms. Casey Rama? Well, you named a few of them. You named connection and content, and yesterday oh, yes. was my first big tiptoe back into live speaking here in New Zealand, level one, um, spoke to a crowd of young real estate professionals 
they were buzzing like the coolest crowd it was you could just tell everybody was happy to be in the same room together and <laughs> Most of the time, you know, you know what it's like. You get in front of a crowd, especially in New Zealand. People are just so nice. They're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you ask a question, and it's just like crickets. But yesterday, yeah. they were hands up. Everybody was taking the piss out of me, and I was like, yes, New Zealand, yes. They were um, stoked just to see humans in a room again. That's it. That, and we talked about that for five minutes. But the crux of the entire keynote was about connection and how you make connections in an age of abject disconnect and a lot of the time it just took some storytelling and some talking and it was cool man there was that and i'm really excited about i don't know if you saw our mate cam wallace leaving near new zealand oh, oh yes 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 oh, with media yeah. works i, I sent him, him some fists yes so that news is now public and i'm just so excited to see what cam does for the media industry here so yeah so this quite it's quite a big i mean air new zealand's had a big shape up shake up from their execs in the last little while and a lot of people are asking questions about a whole bunch of different things because it obviously sends a message when half the an exec team of such a big business does that but obviously at the same time i guess losing 5.5 billion dollars it's going to take a while to build that back up so it's like do they yeah. go to a startup or does that skill set play where you know if, if i'm dealing with billions on a daily basis then i've got to go back down to millions you know is my skill set best served here maybe maybe not i'm sure that was a conversation that they had but the optics from the outside especially with shareholders and government and whatever is what's going on here why is yeah. it you know dot 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 uh what was when you heard the news when you knew that it might be rolling when you uh, look at the landscape around media works and the play um how do you think the uh, announcement of cam wallace's new ceo for media works will potentially play out you know, as somebody who knows Cam, I am so stoked for New Zealand, for the industry, for media. He's, so we met when I was at Air New Zealand, um, and I had a lot of respect for him from day, since day one, but now I have a lot of love for him. And he's the kind of guy that will push envelopes, but he's so smart. Um, he's mm -hmm. strategic and he's calculated with the risks that he takes. And when I left Air New Zealand actually four years ago this week, I went into media. I went to NZ Me. So it kind of feels like there's this little trajectory. Obviously, he went a bit higher. <laughs> 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 he went he went straight into that, you know, that top seat. Um, but I feel like there's a, there's a real necessity for somebody like Cam in media right now. Um, he knows the airline industry back to front. And so for him, he's the kind of person that I think will ask the right questions and go, what do we need to do? to lift New Zealand as a whole. He'll be that tide that lifts all the ships. I, you know, so I'm really, I'm really happy about that. I'm kind of excited mm. and stoked, you know, when, you, when your friends now, do stuff and you feel all warm. I, I definitely <laughs> uh, know the feeling. The, the bit I'm maybe asking is um, with Discovery buying it mm -hmm. and they obviously bought it for strategic reasons, local production, global distribution, dot, 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 dot um, international content they can plug in without having to pay for licensing and all the rest of it. Um, where do you think the biggest, the number one or two things that he's going to have to put his energy into when it comes to either content, localized stuff or externally, like what, what do you think if you're in his spot with looking at MediaWorks as a business, where would you focus the aim? I think the first two things that you just said, um, so local content, local stories, and not just the slapstick old school kind of you you know what's coming down the line, um, episodic stuff that we're getting, uh, whether it's it's radio or, or other kinds of content. Um, I think we're getting a lot of the sameness. Um, I've been here 20 years and it's like, you kind of know what's coming down the line. So I feel like there's a, a, a play for innovative content that's local. And, you know, there are some amazing stories being told um, kind of, in the underground of the content world and the documentary films, yeah, yeah. I feel like there's like a real, I don't know, there's a bubbling of great podcasting that isn't just repackaging up uh, radio and pushing it back mm. out as a radio or show. Copy now pasting globally and put it in, in New Zealand market and put a different face to it. Some big grade celeb doing the same shit, right? Correct. So I feel like there's a place, uh, and I know this sounds wanky, but for innovative content strategy, that's just not being being done here. And that's, that's around hmm. audio, that's around video, that's around the stuff that you and I talk about a lot of the time with um, the predators that go out, the producer, director, editors that can go out on a budget and, you know, three people in a field and just create 
beautiful, impactful, like meaty stories. So I feel like the storytelling side of things is, is going to, he'll lean into so, that, I think. So if, if you're them looking at it, are you thinking it's, is it some type of vehicle for mass local production where then they can have bigger distribution for it? Do you think it's, you know, is it starting up, you know, like YouTube will have these creator studio hub type things where they can then get local crew in. Like, do you feel it's really going to, do you think there's going to be a localized player to truly empower creators to actually get output? And is that the ninja move of kind of the, 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 the YouTubers of talent as person, but without the production, big production companies behind it. And actually, do you think maybe he'll empower people? Is that, do you think that might be the strategy? I mean, that is something that he does regardless, <laughs> but yeah. I think, um, re, you know, wherever it will go, I think the thing that Cam will bring is an open mind. He won't be tied down to anything in particular, but what you just said there would be my perfect world. Um, how do you mm. empower and then distribute en masse, meaning to New Zealand audiences, uh, stuff that really matters? Well, I, what I meant by people wasn't like the people as staff. I mean, people as the pr the predators, the the yeah. the the actual creators themselves. Because if it's about ideas and it's if it, it becomes a thing of, you know, do we copy globally or do we create locally? And if you copy globally, it's copy paste. We've seen that before. If it's yeah. create locally, then it's like, well, how do you actually scale that up? Because if say if it's news reporting, there's only three news presenters. If it's this, there's, there's these small buckets. So um, embracing the talent will be a thing. I've got a funky feeling that maybe after he kicks off the new role, we should maybe get him back on the show and have a banter. Be like, all right, Cam, so you're the new CEO, mate. What's going on, buddy? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you do a good Cam impression. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's funny, man. I, I, like, I, I, re I like his style. He's got a good energy. You can tell he generally gives a shit. And I think those are at least – and, yes, there are a lot of – commercial pressures globally and locally and mm -hmm. business model challenges and advertise. There's a lot of, let's just call it shit to deal with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But simultaneously, if you don't have a leader that actually cares or understands the thing or isn't willing to ask the right question or actually listen well enough to ask the right question, you might be, you know, it's, yeah. it's going to be a good challenge for him. I mean, jumping into, it's a big step into it's that good. world, especially, but. It is. And I think, you know, with the last year and, and, all of the hardships that Air New Zealand faced, and he led really adeptly through that mm. that time. I'd say even through all of his tenure, and this is just me talking, not him, um, that he's learned so much that will be applicable to to stepping into a media role like the one he's stepping into. So, like you said, he he cares, he gives a shit, and he's smart. Mm. He's a really smart guy when it comes to the finances, the revenue, bringing in ways to help media survive and thrive. So I'm yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that one. Cool. I get yeah. it. Um, what else is bubbling? Um, I what was listening to you and Ho well, I was listening to you and Holly talk, and yeah. I loved that she was she was like, "We need to just describe what lobbyists do in a short sense." And I was like, "Girl, I feel like that with my job." But <laughs> she said, "What she does is like I wrote it down right here." She said, "It's advocacy at its finest," and I was like, mm. "Wow, isn't that like every job that feels meaningful?" advocacy at its finest Ooh. and I just I wanted to bring that one back up because I thought that was a little spark of madness that she brought to the show this mm. morning she's very smart that old Holly uh, I think she's she, very tapped out with the is. politics for this for this um <laughs> um you know she was talking about the, the lobbyist side not many knows not many people roll I think the bit that she missed in that is there's not many females there's not many mm. young people and there's not mm. many Maori <laughs> and I think when you combine those three it's very clear there's there's a lot that that certain sectors are missing which I'm sure we could get uh any into um media uh, do we want to talk about potentially our event thing if you would like to, I'm more than happy to talk about that. I had one more little topic that I thought we could chat about. Okay, you go topic. Let's go. Um, so I don't know if you caught it earlier this week. I did a live stream with a local artist called Cora Allen Wycliffe. So she's oh, Maori no. uh, Nuean artist who is the only person on the planet that's doing this art form called Hiapo, which is basically, um, uh, I think it's like a, a paper fiber wrap that goes around folks when they pass away. So it's like almost a shroud and she's bringing it back. And you just mentioned young female Modi. Um, Cora is the only person bringing back this like traditional ancestral art form. And it just went straight into my brain going, she has faced similar things where um, some elders and more traditional older people have um, not put the, the brakes on her, but we were talking about how you single-handedly bring back um, an art form. And it just shows me that there's so many different 
places in the world where we need to welcome young female mm. uh, innovators. Well, it's, it's whether you like to or not, most of the crew that actually change the majority comes from the minority. The big, yes. the big, um, you know, like the the big shifts is always tension that builds against it, that builds momentum behind it. But it's the bravery from those. I guess the first movers that are those minorities, and unfortunately, maybe it's a minority with with your race, or your gender, or your orientation, or your education level, or your location, or your accent, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, it, it always feels that that builds, brings tension with it, or maybe that helps yeah. cut through the clutter, whatever it is. But yeah, that, that's geez, that's really, really, really interesting. But you you wonder too, I think maybe with that, do you feel that it's more that the elders are too afraid to let the future do it a new way because that's not how it was done and it's more or do you think it's actually because you are a dot 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 i'm saying no or is it i think it's for her it's like uh, you must earn your stripes you know it's, it's hard it. for somebody in an elder community especially when and fair enough too <laughs> i know as i get older when young people are like whoa and i was like whoa, whoa 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 it's gonna but don't slow down because people told me to slow down go go full tilt but also like you earn your stripes as you go and i think for her it's been the the proof point because she's the only person doing it and she had to go do all of the research she's been all over the world doing like deep research into how it's traditionally made she's had to build her own tools she's had to understand how things work she's just had she opened up a gallery in ponsonby this week on, uh, it's called the gray place i believe we're gonna go check it out this weekend um but i think for her it was more like they didn't think she'd earned her stripes yet and maybe didn't understand her process. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing, right, is how we tell our story so that other people do understand our process so that maybe we all start to embrace our differences a bit more. I just had a meeting very recently and I was trying to describe this thing and I just kept trying to do it and my brain just couldn't like get it done right. And then so what we did, I said, all right, I'm going to share you right now into a Google doc and can you just bring that up on your screen? I'm going to start typing and talking. And then I literally did that. And as he started on the other side and then we got like 10 minutes into it and it was like a, um, a format convergence of what I was saying to what he was saying. And the next thing you know, like, that's it. But I think there's, there's something in that with once again, that, you know, it's communication. How do you communicate? What's the best way to do it? And if you can't to the other side and that's going to make it make a big difference. Um, Cassie, have you gone for your run today? You've gone for your half I a have, mile, half a marathon. <laughs> I haven't. I'm going to do that right after this. Hence hence the old sweatshirt ready yep. to go. Uh, the lighting looks good. You got, any, got any, some new lights going on? What's good? What's going on? Yep. Um, I'm what using my you phone today. I, I, had, I do have a ring light. Um, yep. Here we go. Here we go. Behind the scenes. Oh, there, there you go. go. Behind the scenes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I've been it's relegated like, down to the garage. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. I was like, it's a big it's a big room. I was like, oh, it's a garage. There you go. Nice. It's, it's a garage or oh, a wine, a wine cellar and my studio all in one. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how professional things can look in such a small space. Oh, well, thank you. It's <laughs> great. No, well, I, I, no, I'm saying that for more for you. You've got, you've, your room's like three times big. I'm just in a small little game room here and I've got the similar thing, got the white backdrop this here, but you can definitely make it happen in a, in a small space. Um, very cool, Jan and Cassie. And maybe let's hold on to the event thing and we'll do a drop on that later because I think that's going to be pretty, pretty cool too. Let's do that. Let's do that next week. Um, yeah, stoked. Done. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of the weekend. I'm excited to see what happens tomorrow. And uh, yep. thanks so much for your time and your your good thinking. And um, big props to your your friend Cam for the big new role. I'll, maybe you can. Um, we'll have plenty of questions we'll to ask on. him because we are the. We'll get we'll get him on. Maybe we can do a, a three way interview with Cam. We have him in and we'll just like. Kah, 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 kah. Okay. <laughs> you two, you two will kah, 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 and I'll just sit in the corner and go. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> um. Thanks, Cassie. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for your time. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good day. Thanks. Be good. Adios. Cassie Roma coming in, coming in hot on a Friday. Like it. Um, that's been the show, team. Big thanks to our guest, Dion Nash, our founder at Triumph and Disaster. Um, I think it's triumphanddisaster.co.nz. Uh, Holly Bennett, Cassie Roma, uh, good week once again. And big weekend ahead for the politics. Big weekend ahead. What shall happen? What shall what shall go on? Who knows? But I appreciate you all tuning in. Uh, thanks so much for uh, the time. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have, be good. Do good. And I'll see you soon. Adios, team.